What are some of the weirdest crimes people do? Let's find out, starting with... Number 6. Stanley Cups Delaney Garcia Lopez was arrested for allegedly stealing 65 Stanley Cups, valued at around $2,500, from a store in Roseville, California. And no, for all five of you hockey fans out there, not that Stanley Cup. Stanley, the rugged drinkware company and inventor of the vacuum bottle that's popular today. The incident occurred in January of 2024 when Garcia Lopez was caught by Roseville Police Department stuffing her car with the popular drinkware without paying for them. Not only did she face charges of grand theft for stealing over $950 worth of property, but she was also slapped with a DUI charge at the time of her arrest. The arrest caught attention not just because of the sheer number of stolen items, but also because of the surge in popularity of Stanley Cups. These 40-ounce insulated tumblers had become a sensation, particularly among Gen Z, after gaining attention on TikTok. The cups, once marketed primarily to outdoorsmen, had seen a resurgence in demand, with viral videos showing consumers clearing store shelves within minutes and even crying tears of joy after receiving them as Christmas gifts. The incident also highlighted the dark side of the Stanley Cup craze, with reports of school-age kids bullying other kids for not having an official tumbler and warnings from police about counterfeit iterations of the item circulating online. While the exact motive behind Garcia Lopez's alleged theft remains unclear, her actions prompted some humorous speculation. With her car overflowing with Stanley Cups, you can't help but wonder whether she had ambitious plans to sell them for a profit, or if she was simply aiming to amass an impressive collection for display purposes. After all, 65 Stanley Cups would make for an eye-catching conversation starter in any living room. We know a lot about interior decorations. In all seriousness, the incident serves as a reminder of the consequences of engaging in criminal behavior, especially when you've been drinking. Garcia Lopez now faces potential jail time and fines if found guilty of grand theft and DUI charges. While it's understandable to want to join in on the excitement, resorting to theft is never the answer. Let's hope that Garcia Lopez had a plan in mind for those 65 Stanley Cups and wasn't just looking to add them to her weird personal collection of outdoor travel drinkware. Number five, dug up. In Orange County, Florida, a single mother named Amanda Brochu found herself the victim of an unusual theft. Her concrete driveway was stolen right out of the ground. The incident left her home with nothing but a muddy patch of dirt in its place. Brochu's ordeal began shortly after she listed her home for sale. Strange contractors starting appearing, claiming to be there to measure the driveway. In total, five different workers showed up, all with the same story. When questioned, they explained that they had been hired by a man named Andre from the Tampa area to provide estimates for a replacement driveway. They even showed Brochu text messages allegedly from Andre, requesting the estimate and providing her address. However, suspicions arose when the supposed client, Andre, was unreachable and failed to provide proof of ownership when requested. Despite these red flags, Brochu's security camera captured footage of a bulldozer arriving a week later, tearing up the concrete driveway and hauling it away. The homeowner expressed her shock at the bizarre turn of events, stating that she was completely unreachable prepared for such a peculiar theft. Her real estate agent, Rocky Sanchez, described utter disbelief upon learning of the incident. Sanchez took to social media to raise awareness about the missing driveway, believing it to be part of an elaborate scam. Sanchez's suspicions were supported by others in the real estate community who came forward with similar stories of property theft, ranging from driveways to roofs and exteriors. This revelation added a troubling layer to Brochu's predicament, leaving her grappling with the urgency of replacing the driveway way to fulfill the terms of a pending home sale. The pressure mounted as Brochu faced a tight deadline to replace the driveway or risk losing the property she intended to buy nearby. With her recent investments made in roof replacement and other expenses, she now found herself scrambling to secure the funds needed for the $10,000 project. The situation cast a shadow over her plans, jeopardizing her family's future and leaving her feeling helpless. As the investigation into the driveway theft unfolded, the Orange County Sheriff's Office took up the case. However, as of the latest 
this report, there have been no updates on the progress of the investigation or any leads on the identity of the perpetrators. Which is weird, since you'd think the construction company that stole the driveway would be pretty easily identified. No one heard from Andre again, making us think that maybe he was looking for something a little more concrete. Number 4. Art Collecting a Frenchman named Stefan Breitweiser embarked on an impressive spree of art theft, pilfering some 239 pieces from around 200 museums across Europe. His haul, estimated to be worth a staggering $2 billion, included renowned works like Lucas Cranach, the Elder's Sibyl, Princess of Cleves, from the Newcastle in Baden-Baden, Germany. Breitweiser, driven by a passion for art, saw himself as a connoisseur, creating his personal Louvre in the attic of his mother modest home in Mulhouse, France. With his girlfriend, Anne Catherine Kleinklaus, as his accomplice, he executed his heists from 1994 to 2001, targeting mainly museums across France, Holland, Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. His method was simple. Armed with a Swiss army knife, he would remove the paintings from their mounts and conceal them, sometimes even wearing them under his clothing. His girlfriend played the role of lookout, dressed elegantly to blend in with museum goers. Breitweiser's obsession with art was all consumed Assuming. He believed in the transformative power of beauty, considering it the ultimate currency. His actions, however, were driven by a compulsive urge to steal rather than a genuine appreciation for art history. Despite his careful planning and successful heights, Breitweiser's luck eventually ran out. His downfall came in 2001 when he was caught stealing a bugle. Although a minor offense, suspicions arose about his involvement in more significant crimes. Police inspector got a search warrant for Breitweiser's home, leading to a shocking discovery. The walls, once adorned with priceless paintings, were now bare. Breitweiser's mother had disposed of the stolen treasures, tossing them into canals, forests, and even burned some. Breitweiser served over three years in prison for his thefts in France and Switzerland. Upon release, he returned to a life of crime, resorting to shoplifting before eventually reverting to his art theft obsession. Despite his immense talent for stealing, Breitweiser's downfall came when he attempted to sell his loot on eBay, leading to his arrest yet again. In his latest trial in April of 2023, he was sentenced to house arrest, wearing an ankle monitor until 2031. Reflecting on his actions, Breitweiser expressed remorse, acknowledging his fall from a master of the universe to nothing. And of course, his mom reverted to the classic mom behavior of just throwing invaluable collections in the garbage because she didn't know what they were. It's true for comic books, baseball cards, and now priceless art. Oh my god, mom. I can't believe leave you threw away my Brett Favre rookie cards. You're so lame. Ugh. Number three. 32 going on 13. Here's an update on the case of Shelby Hewitt, a 32-year-old social worker accused of posing as a traumatized high school student in Boston. Appearing in court, facing nine charges, including forgery and fraud, Hewitt's alleged scheme was as elaborate as it was weird. Over a span of more than a year, Hewitt assumed the identity of a severely traumatized foster child, fabricating a backstory complete with forged documents. She managed to enroll in three different public high schools in Boston, Austin, including Brighton High School, English High School, and Jeremiah E. Burke High School. What makes this case particularly weird is the extent of Hewitt's deception. Not only did she adopt fake names and personas, but she also embedded herself within the school communities, even joining extracurricular activities such as the girls' basketball team at Burke High School. In a bizarre twist, she reportedly declined to participate in team photos, claiming her foster parents prohibited it. Hewitt even selected the number 32 for her basketball jersey, a detail that actually adds an interesting layer to the story given it was her actual age. Throughout her time at these schools, Hewitt allegedly made friends with students, weaving all kinds of stories about her background and family life. She even went so far as to ask to be called by different names. Perhaps the most unsettling aspect of Hewitt's alleged actions is that she was employed as a social worker by the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families, entrusted with the well-being of vulnerable children. Her purported scheme involved exploiting her position and knowledge of the system to bypass normal enrollment procedures, using federal laws regarding the immediate enrollment of foster children to her advantage. Despite the seriousness of the charges she faces, Hewitt's defense attorney emphasized her mental health challenges, suggesting that her actions may have been influenced by underlying psychological issues. As if that's going to somehow make everyone go, oh, okay, well, no biggie. The case has left many unanswered questions, particularly regarding Hewitt's motives. Why would a grown woman 
go to such lengths to pose as a high school student? What did she hope to gain from her scam? Furthermore, the fact that Hewitt was able to carry out her deception for over a year before being caught raises concerns about the oversight and security measures in place within the Boston public school system. Parents and community members are understandably alarmed by the breach of trust and the potential risks posed by Hewitt's presence in the schools. Number two, Mr. Not Anonymous. Rob Strain, a 33-year-old man from the UK, made up a story about winning 171 million pounds in the Euro Millions jackpot. His supposed windfall quickly became the talk of the town, with Strain boasting to family, friends, and even locals at his nearby shop that he was the fortunate winner of the third largest lottery prize in history. The fantastical claims didn't stop there. Strain allegedly also told other stories of newfound wealth, boasting of extravagant spending sprees on lavish homes, fancy cars, and even private security. Photographs circulating on social media showing him apparently enjoying his newfound riches, standing tall and proud, seemingly without a care in the world. However, the charade soon began to unravel as suspicions arose among those who knew him. It wasn't long before whispers circulated about the legitimacy of Strain's supposed winnings, especially after he and his girlfriend were borrowing money despite his wealth. The truth came to light when Camelot, the company behind the Euro Millions lottery, said that a genuine ticket holder had actually claimed the prize. Strain's name was notably absent from the list of legitimate winners, further blowing up his ridiculous story. The fallout from Strain's alleged deception left those who had been taken in feeling betrayed and disillusioned. One man, who had lent money to Strain, expressed feeling physically sick upon learning the truth, comparing his experience to being bent over a barrel. It looks like Strain's plan was to get some personal loans from people based on his supposed winnings. And he was always going to get caught, since obviously his lot of winnings were never going to come. There were other ways he could have claimed to be getting money too, so we're not sure why he'd pick something that can be easily checked, unless he just wanted some attention, which is also weird since usually lottery winners get too much attention from people seeking handouts. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here to find out about some of these rappers' dumbest crimes. Number 1. 20 Years of Faking Christopher Stoltz, a veteran from New Hampshire, admitted to a bizarre scheme, faking his need for a wheelchair for two decades to claim over $660,000 in benefits he was not entitled to. In a surprising twist, Stoltz, who worked as a kindergarten teacher, managed to deceive both the Department of Veterans Affairs and his colleagues posing as a severely disabled individual. Claiming in early 2003 that he could no longer use his feet, Stoltz convinced the VA to rate him as one 100% disabled, leading to a significant increase in his monthly benefits. Over the years, he continued to perpetuate the lie, even receiving funds to purchase and modify special cars to accommodate his supposed disability. However, Stoltz's elaborate ruse began to unravel when law enforcement officers observed him walking normally on multiple occasions without the assistance of his wheelchair. In one instance, after appearing to use a wheelchair at a VA medical center in Boston, he was seen walking around a mall soon after leaving the facility. This pattern repeated when he left a Manchester VA medical center, further backing up suspicions about his fraudulent activities. Ultimately, Stoltz pleaded guilty to one count of making false statements to the Department of Veteran Affairs. As part of his plea deal, he faced up to 18 months in prison and was required to repay the $662,800 he received. The plea agreement also revealed that Stoltz admitted that he had sold the specially adapted adapted vehicles provided by the VA. Stoltz's scam makes you wonder about his motivations. Was it that he simply liked being in a wheelchair, had a love for scamming, or was it just stupidity? Whatever his reasons were, the length and scale of his deception is weird, right? It's like he found a way to get paid, but in exchange for avoiding standing in public for the rest of his life. No thank you. What are some of the dumbest situations rappers get into? Let's get right into it and start with... Number 5. 
Stitches, the responsible rapper. Philip Katsabanis is a South Florida rapper better known as Stitches. He faced charges of drug and weapons possession after a confrontation in his Bay Harbor Island business. According to Stitches, four people broke into his business, a studio space with a bar attached, in August 2022. When they refused to leave, Stitches told his wife to hide in the back of the shop while he dealt with the situation. Stitches claimed to have seen four guys in his building, one carrying a rifle with a scope. He claims to have told the intruders to leave multiple times, but you know how it is with burglars, right? They never listen. So Stitches fired a couple warning shots, hoping it would help their listening skills, which it must have. When police arrived, the business was empty and there were no signs of a break-in. Body camera footage instead showed Stitches talking to the police about the four intruders in his building. He appeared slightly inebriated while he rambled about not having issues with anyone and mentioned he'd just bought a new house. He also told the cops he'd taken painkillers and some nose beers just before the break-in. The only evidence of illegal goings-on at Stitch's place that police found was powdered sugar that wasn't actually sugar. So Stitches himself got arrested. Although Bay Harbor Island police arrested Stitches for drug possession and discharging a firearm in public, they never turned in the stash of, let's call it, uh, not powdered sugar to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement's Controlled Substance Lab. No one knows what happened to it. Miami-Dade prosecutors were forced to drop the charges after 30 days passed without the substance being submitted for testing. Stitches had reported that one of the supposed intruders had a rifle, and after warning the four men multiple times to leave, he fired two shots. As the initial report stated, the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office also found that Stitches didn't discharge his weapon in public after all. He fired two rounds inside his own business to protect himself and his family, falling in line with Florida's stand your ground policy. Stitches, for his part, did say that he only used the amount of force necessary to protect his family and was cautious of his surroundings. The September 2022 incident wasn't Stitch's first time dealing with law enforcement. In January 2017, the then 21-year-old parked in a handicapped spot in the most gangsta place he could, a Miami Whole Foods. Officers somehow recognized Stitch's from previous arrests when they pulled him over and asked if he was armed. After confirming he wasn't, he tried to hand one of the officers a mind-altering cigarette as proof. They searched the car, finding a gun and ammunition under his seat. Stitches was confused, saying that he thought they wanted to know if he actually had a weapon on him rather than just having one in the car. <laughs> We've all been there. During the search, cops also uncovered a mason jar filled with just under 40 grams and pills that weren't prescribed to him. Stitches was booked for having a concealed weapon and possession of, let's call it, some uh, illegal things. If the rap game doesn't work out for him, Stitches is also a great clown name. Number four, scamming the IRS. Samira Merrill is a rapper from Detroit, and she went on the run after being charged with stealing over $5 million from the IRS and missing multiple court appearances. It always hurts to see the IRS get victimized. They go through a lot. Meryl worked with Noelle Brown, who performed with her as part of the female rap group Deuces Wild. Their name references poker, though, not number twos. Oddly, their music is similar. Together, the Deuces participated in an elaborate tax scheme from 2013 to 2017 and claimed refunds and withholdings of over $13.6 million. In July 2021, they were charged with aggravated identity theft, conspiracy, and false claims. Shortly after they were charged, Meryl disappeared, missing meetings with her attorney and not attending pre pretrial services. Pretrial services called her a few days after they initially spoke, but couldn't reach her after that. It's always best to just ignore legal issues, right? Authorities visited the wig shop where Merrill claimed to work, but soon discovered that the business might have never existed. Neighboring businesses claimed the wig shop didn't even seem to be open. Although it was typically vacant, a nearby business owner claimed to see someone show up every few months. Pretrial services contacted Merrill's lawyer, who said her client planned on coming in, but again, Merrill never showed up. Less than a week later, Merrill's attorney was unable to reach her as well. Pretrial services went to her house, where they spoke to an unknown man who wouldn't provide information about her whereabouts, as unknown men are wont to do. The court revoked Merrill's bond and issued a new warrant for her arrest. The two women filed fraudulent tax returns for estate and trusts under business and filed returns for trusts under other people's identities without their consent. They involved others and made them pay the women money from the refunds they received. In total, they filed 122 returns, which the IRS linked together due to commonalities in the filings. Most had the same payer on 1099 forms, and some trust returns had the same return preparers as well. 106 of the returns were filed by paper and mailed to the IRS, with 69 
nine coming from Michigan and 13 sent from Georgia. The returns filed electronically came from at least four IP addresses and investigators later connected two of them to Merrill. Most of the refunds went to accounts opened by Merrill, including two checks for $60,000 for two businesses, Lucid Communications and Clean Sweet Properties. Merrill deposited a further 31,000 bucks for a check made out to four Weaves Only Distributors Trust and another for Lucid Communications for $57,000. On top of that, Merrill put 20 trust tax refund checks into accounts under her name for $1.3 million. Those wild deuces filed returns under other people's names and requested $2.5 million in refunds under one victim's name. The IRS paid out $462,601, which was deposited into an account under the woman's name, despite her never opening it. They set up trusts and filed tax returns under another victim's name, using her ID to open accounts, rent apartments, and make big purchases that included watches and jewelry. They filed eight falsified refunds under the victim's name. They also requested $1.6 million in refunds from 2016 to 2017 using the same victim's information, but they were never paid out. Noelle Brown told one of her childhood best friends that Merrill could help her apply for a business grant. The friend gave Brown her social security number and date of birth, always smart, which she then passed on to Merrill. The friend received a check for $51,000 from the IRS, and Brown made her pay $28,975 to clean, sweet properties, Merrill's business. However, when she realized someone had filed a tax return under her name, she said she wasn't the one to sign it, and that whoever did spelled her name wrong. She wouldn't have agreed to the plan if she'd known it involved filing a tax return and thought she was only applying for a grant. Brown referred many victims to Merrill, who also received millions of dollars from the scam. Authorities eventually tracked hide-and-seek champion Samira Merrill down in Memphis, Tennessee, and took her into custody. Her attorney no longer felt it was appropriate to represent her, as their relationship was broken down and couldn't be repaired. Ultimately, the IRS paid out $5.5 million to the women before uncovering their scheme. Merrill was facing a 10-year sentence prior to her failure to appear. Number 3. Megan and Tori Grammy award-winning hip-hop artist Megan Thee Stallion was shot by rapper Tori Lanez after an argument. The pair had a close friendship and would often drink and go to parties together. They also, at one point, had a romantic connection but weren't exclusive. Miss Thee Stallion sustained long-term nerve damage in her left foot following the assault and had to have surgery. As bad as it sounds, though, this is good, considering what normally happens to horses in these situations. She could have been Megan Thee Glue. Lanez tried to pay Megan $1 million to not tell the cops what happened. Following the incident, he kept apologizing and begged her to keep it quiet. Stallion invited Lanez to a pool party at Kylie Jenner's house alongside Kelsey Harris, her best friend and assistant at the time. Harris also had the world's biggest crush on Lanez. Stallion eventually decided it was time to giddy up on down to the homestead, but Lanez wanted to stay. Eventually, the trio got into an SUV with Stallion's bodyguard and drove away with Tori Lanez having a little tantrum. On the drive home, Lanez randomly confronted Megan and demanded that she come clean to Harris about their romance romantic relationship. As the discussion became heated, Megan got out of the car with the intent of walking home herself. But since she's one of the most famous rappers in the world, she decided that probably wasn't the best plan. Once they reached a quieter street, Megan got out of the car again and started to walk away. Lenez yelled something at her and she turned around to see he had a gun in his hand, which he was pointing at her feet. A witness claimed to see two women pulling each other's hair and hitting one another. He believed one of the girls fired the first shot, but added that he saw Lanez firing bullets everywhere. Stallion denied ever seeing Harris holding a gun that night, probably because Megan was punching her. The case caused Stallion a lot of physical and emotional pain and immense public and industry backlash. While in the witness box during the trial, she said she wished he'd killed her, which is a bit dramatic. After the attack, the stallion was handcuffed to a gurney as she traveled in an ambulance to the hospital. A female officer asked her questions while she was still bleeding from her injuries. The shooting overshadowed her career for a while, and many men in the industry took Lanez aside. Megan claimed that she was turned into the story's villain, and the focus was more on who she slept with rather than what happened to her. The defense suggested Megan didn't know who shot her as she walked away in an attempt to throw Harris under the bus. But Megan, being the proud stallion she is, stood her ground and clarified that she had turned around before Lenez opened fire. When police asked her what happened to her feet, Megan said she'd walked on broken glass, diehard style. She later said she fibbed because snitching about who just shot you was frowned upon in the hip hop community, and she was worried about the possibility of police brutality against Lenez. She was worried about the guy who just shot her. It's that kind of attitude that probably got her invited to Kylie Jenner's pool party to begin with. If that was us, we would have added extra things to make sure police brutality was involved. Yeah, he just shot me. He also said he thought you're 
uniform makes you look fat, but it probably wasn't the uniform's fault. Lenez pleaded not guilty to assault with a semi-automatic firearm and carrying a concealed firearm in a vehicle, but in December 2022, the jury found him guilty of all charges. He faces at least 20 years in prison. But that pool party at Kylie Jenner's house must have been amazing, though. She probably has the best pizza and the coolest party hats and party favors. And playing Marco Polo in that pool? Man. Number two, phony swag man. Tunisian rapper Swagman is known for using social media to flaunt his extreme wealth. Well, until he was imprisoned for fraud and money laundering. Swagman, whose real name is Ateb Zabit, bragged about his lavish lifestyle on social media, sharing videos of himself doing smart things like burning money and showing off his expensive vehicles. But in July 2019, he was arrested for defrauding his fans. The scheme targeted fans whose ages ranged from 13 to 35. Many of them admired the rapper for his success as he made it seem like his parents abandoned abandoned him at a young age, forcing him to live on the street. Swag offered fans the opportunity to get involved in lucrative investment opportunities and asked for their help with various humanitarian causes. He also asked them to pay his bail if he was arrested. Swag's victims, who were based in France, Tunisia, Algeria, and Canada, lost over $1.7 million in his schemes between 2019 and 2020. Tunisian authorities arrested Zabit after noticing suspicious money transfers in a Swiss bank account and defrauding his fans. A Tunis court sentenced him to five years in jail for fraud and money laundering, following accusations of extorting millions of dollars. Additionally, they fined him $36,000 and confiscated $6 million in Swiss francs and euros from his accounts, and he potentially faced 100 years in prison. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case, and his January 2022 appeal led to the judge dismissing the case. Swag also faced charges and accusations in France for his scams, but his arrest warrant was ultimately withdrawn as there wasn't sufficient evidence to indict him for fraud. David quickly returned to social media and soon flaunted his wealth to all his followers again. He threatened to counter sue anyone that accused him of fraud moving forward. The rapper originally lured his fans with his story about being orphaned and self-made until it became public that he wasn't an orphan and that his father lived in Tunisia. Zybit's victims trusted him with their money as his social media showed him living a luxurious lifestyle and he had over 2 million followers on Facebook. One of his victims, Pierre, received a direct message from the rapper. An orphan himself, Pierre felt connected to Zabit when he claimed to be an orphan as well. Although he didn't know much about the rapper's music, he felt he could help him achieve his dream of buying back his grandmother's old house. He had $27,000 for the down payment, and Zabit offered to invest the money, claiming he'd be able to triple it in three weeks. With the understanding that Pierre would refund the money if there were any issues, Pierre met him in Paris and gave it to him in cash. However, something seemed off. The next day, Zabit was on a YouTube show where he pulled out an envelope of cash. Pierre recognized the purple elastic band around some of the bills and knew it was his money. The two communicated through social media, where Zabit convinced Pierre to pay an additional $10,000 to cover the taxes on the profits of his first payment. When the investigation into the matter was taking place, Pierre ran into Zabit at the police station, but his scammer claimed that they had never met before. It was not very swaggy of him. Unfortunately, Pierre was only one of many victims who shared similar stories. In 2018, an employee of Refacent, the third largest Swiss bank, Stefano B, transferred $8.73 million dollars out of multiple clients accounts to a US company and 5.7 million dollars to a private account in Tunisia. The banker then fled to Panama to pick up his money in Bitcoin, a transaction he organized with an accomplice on the dark web. When one of his victims noticed the transfer, she alerted the bank who blocked it. Stefano turned himself in to the Swiss consulate in Panama. The Tunisian account he sent some of the money to belonged to Zabit, and the US account was Luxury Properties, a real estate company he managed with his girlfriend. Zabit denied ever doing business with Stefano B, despite his obvious involvement. In 2019, a Tunisian strategy consultant set up a website for Zabit's victims to bring their case to court in Tunisia, but in September 2021, he filed a complaint claiming the site was attempted blackmail. In March 2022, he filed another complaint against the prosecutor in Tunis for falsifying documents in a money laundering case. As it stands, Swag is free and currently touring. Number one, spot him, got him, cap him, charge him. Florida rapper Spot him, got him attempted to flee arrest on a jet ski, but Miami cops caught and arrested him. Spot him, got him, whose real name is Nehemia Hardin, was speeding on his jet ski and weaving around anchored boats when a Miami police officer spotted him going too fast in a restricted speed zone. When the officer attempted to conduct a traffic stop, got him sped away while swerving around boats and coming close to a swimming area. We're not sure where he thought he was going to go in his attempt to evade 
police on a jet ski, but the dude has to maintain his street cred. The rapper was already on bond for his role in a July 2021 assault in a parking garage. Harden was in the backseat of a Dodge Charger when he got into a confrontation with the parking attendant over an $80 parking fee. According to police reports, Gotham pointed a firearm with a laser at the attendant before fleeing the scene. U.S. Marshals issued an arrest warrant for him, prompting officers to enter his hotel room at the AC Hotel Miami Aventura while he was still lying in bed. He had a Romam Sugir Draco, a type of pistol that looks like an AK, at the side of his bed. In September 2021, Gotham was shot in his hip in his Dodge Charger as he drove down a Miami highway. A backseat passenger was also hit in both legs. Less than a year after the drive-by, Gotham tried to outrun police who spotted him while speeding on his jet ski. When they eventually got him, he was arrested and charged with reckless boat operation in fleeing law enforcement officers. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather do. Run 15 miles or give a speech in front of 1,000 people.